Let's talk about mass balances in three dimensions. And we will use Cartesian coordinates and then we will also look at cylindrical coordinates and spherical coordinates towards the end. But we will start by trying to kind of derive an equation in 3D uh, using Cartesian coordinates. When we have that equation, we will simplify it back to 1D and we will look at integration constants and see what they actually mean. And then we will drive the Stefan diffusion equation from this big 3D equation. And finally, try to understand why we can use different and when we should use different coordinate systems to describe our system. So here we have uh, an infinitesimal cube, rather large one, but still. Let's now try to make a mass balance for that. In plus prod equals out plus ac. And let's simplify. So only convection, no reaction, and no diffusion. Uh, try to make a mass balance for this one. A small hint. So if everything happens in the z-axis direction, you can think of this cube having a certain concentration on one side, Ca, and another concentration on the other side, Ca plus dCa. And then this cube have a certain volume, so it's dx times dy times dz. So pause here and try to do that yourself. Okay, so how did you manage? Uh, well, what comes in, uh, you need to have a velocity, right? To get uh, the convective part. And let's assume that that convection, uh, that velocity is constant. So if you have Vz coming in, times the concentration, times the area, and the area is dx, times dy. And what comes out? Well, that's Ca plus dCa, and that times the velocity times the area. And what about the accumulation? Well, we have a concentration in here, which is approximately Ca, because dCa is so small. So it's essentially Ca in here. And we are interested in how many moles we have in here and how that changes over time. So we take the concentration times the volume, and the volume is dx, dy, dz. And we divide that with dt. So that's our equation, but let's simplify it a bit. Uh, we have dx, dy, dz. Let's divide with that. And what we get is vz times dca, dz, uh, plus dca, dt equals zero. So that's the equation. The convective part plus the accumulation uh, equals zero. So in the convective part, we have actually now uh, taken both the in and out. So in, uh, in minus out. Okay, so that's one equation. Let's now beef it up a bit and include diffusion and reaction as well. And one hint before you try to do that yourself you should think of, com uh, of the diffusive part now as something happening in this plane and something happening in that plane. And the concentration is not the same there as it is there. So pause here and try yourself. Okay. Diffu uh, the convective part is still the same as before. The diffusive part, well, it's always minus diffusivity times the concentration gradient. And what is the concentration? Well, on this side is Ca, right? So it's the Ca dz on this side, and then times the area. And on the other side, the concentration is Ca plus dCa. So there we have the uh, this thing divided by dz. And then uh, the times the diffusivity and the area. So that's fine so far. What about the reaction? Well, how do we deal with the reaction? Let's just say that we have a certain reaction rate, Ra, that produces a certain number of mole per second inside this one. Uh, mole, mole per second and cubic meter. Then we need to multiply that with the volume. And the volume is dx, dy, dz. 
So we get this equation and we can shuffle that around. And just as before, with when we took the convection, you have Vz times Ca coming in, and we also have Vz times Ca coming out, and we also have the Vz times the DC, DCA coming out. Uh, so certain things go away, and the final equation we get at can be written like Vz times the Ca dz plus the Ca dt, the, which is the accumulation, equals diffusivity times d2 Ca dz2 plus Ra. So that's our equation. And the, the nice thing with Cartesian coordinates is when we now take the next step and say that we want to allow for things happening in all directions, we can like actually think the same way, strangely enough, and just sum things together. We won't show that here, but the final thing you get then is this equation. The accumulation, same as before, the CADT, the convection, now has three different parts, what happens in the x, the y, and the z axis direction, and then you have the diffusion uh, in three different directions, and then you have the reaction. So that's our equation. And of course we can simplify this one, so if we only have things happening in one dimension, the derivatives uh, in the y and the x axis direction, they disappear, so we are left with this equation here, and if there is no reaction, we simply talk, take away Ra. If there is no convection, then we get sec, uh, fixed second law. The accumulation equals the diffusion. So dc a dt equals the uh, diffusivity times d2 c a dz2. And if we also have stationary conditions, then dc a dt equals zero, or in other words, the diffusivity times d2 c a dx dz2 equals zero. Okay, let's, before we try to derive the Stefan diffusion equation uh, from this, let's step back a bit and think about integration constants. Look at these three equations. I think you recognize these. Uh, S here is the distance, A is the acceleration, and T is the time. So this is, these three equations are all about traveling. Do these three expressions say exactly the same thing? And what is needed to calculate S with the first equation, with the second equation, and with the third equation? Pause here and try to figure that out. Okay, if we, if we look at the third equation there, d2s dt2 equals a, if we integrate that, we almost get the second equation, almost. Because what we get is the SDT equals AT plus an integration constant. And if we take that equation and integrate that, we get a second integration constant. So S equals AT squared divided by 2 plus the first integration constant times T plus the second integration constant. And you might recognize those. Because if we look at uh, a familiar equation, s equals s0 plus v0 times t plus a t squared divided by 2, that's identical to what we have here, right? So the first integration constant we had, that's the initial velocity. And the second integration constant we got, that's the initial distance. So integration constants have physical interpretations. So let's take the 3D mass balance and derive the Stefan diffusion equation and things only happening in the, in the z-axis direction. So pause here and try to derive that equation yourself. Okay, did you manage? There is one uh, thing that is might uh, feel a bit awkward here and that's when you start to simplify. Well, we said that the only thing that happens now in the, is in the z-axis directions. So dc a dx disappears, d to c a dx 2 disappears, and the same in the y-axis direction. So those disappears. Uh, there is no accumulation in here that we simplify away in the Stefan diffusion, and there is no reaction. But there is both convection 
and the fusion. So the equation we get is Vz times the CADZ equals diffusivity times D2CADZ2. But that's not quite the equation we had when we talked about the Stefan diffusion. So let's integrate the equation and then we get Vz times CA equals the diffusivity times DCADZ plus an integration constant. We're almost home now. Let's shuffle around and see what the constant is. The constant is minus diffusivity times the CADZ plus Vc, uh, Vz times CA. Do you recognize this? Minus diffusivity times the concentration gradient, that's the diffusive transport, and Vz times CA, that's the convective transport. So what is the integration constant? Well, it's the molar transport. So integration constants always have physical interpretations. Okay, finally, we looked at Cartesian coordinates. If you have Cartesian coordinates and you want to, to study a system that, that is cylindrical, you run into some problems. It becomes a bit uh, difficult to describe where the cylinder ends. I mean, in this direction, fine. There is a certain height, so that could be, for example, the z-axis direction. But in that direction, well, if you go here, it's further away than there, right? Hmm. So how to deal with that? And even stranger, if you try to take this one and describe that in Cartesian coordinates, you get also problems in describing where, where this surface ends. So Cartesian coordinates are good if you live in Manhattan, for example. You can tell which uh, street intersection you live on, and then you tell which floor you live on. And with that information, people can find you. But if you live in a cylinder, or if you live in a sphere, then there are easier ways to describe the system. So for cylindrical coordinates, you can describe the height and the distance out and the angle. So the height, the distance out from the center, and then the angle. And with spheres, you can take uh, the midpoint as your reference and then take the distance out and then the angle in one direction and then the angle in the second direction. And with that, you can simply, in a simple way, describe all positions. So when choose different coordinate systems? Well, the thing is that you choose coordinate systems depending on what your system looks like. I mean, if you, if you want to model a spherical pill, for example, it could be good to use spherical coordinates because your description becomes easier. And with that, perhaps your numerical calculations will be faster than if you try to describe a sphere using Cartesian coordinates. And the same goes if you have a cylinder, a cylindrical pill, for example you might want to choose cylindrical coordinates. So you choose uh, this, the coordinate system that describes your system in a simple way. But if you have strange uh, shapes, like this one, for example, or you might have this thing, uh, it might not be... The, the gain you get by choosing different coordinate systems might not actually influence the calculation speed so much. Since we can use different coordinate systems, uh, there are different ways of writing uh, the mass balance in three dimensions. But there is actually a way to write it independent of the coordinate system. And that's by using the Nabla operator. If we use the Nabla operator, our equation becomes this. The CADT plus V times nabla CA equals the diffusivity times nabla squared CA plus RA, the, the reaction rate. What nabla means is take derivatives in all directions. What nabla squared means is take second order derivatives in all directions. And in Cartesian coordinates, the nice thing is that these become kind of independent. So 
you get three different terms vx times dc dx for example and the same with uh, the both in the convection and the diffusion you get three distinct things but in cylindrical coordinates and also in spherical coordinates it gets a bit messed up so uh, the theta part in the cylindrical equation becomes v theta so the velocity the angle velocity times the ca the theta times one divided by r and you see in the diffusive part it gets also a bit ugly and the same goes for spherical coordinates that the equation looks a bit more complicated than what it does for Cartesian coordinates.